wanted to kind of follow up on uh, the youth lectureship. Uh, kind of had a weekend theme at 160 directed towards youth, and I thought I wanted to kind of keep that going a little bit this morning and talk about raising confident boys. But I don't want to leave the girls out, so many of the applications will be the same. Uh, Derek and Ryan spoke, or two of the speakers there yesterday, and really did a great, fantastic job. Uh, Derek is actually in Bend this morning. The church in Bend wanted him to come over and speak for them, and of course that's where his family attends, and that was something very providential for him to be able that they could hear him and be with his family as well. So keep him in your prayers as he traveled there and as he travels back across Mount Hood to get back home. So we want to talk about raising confident boys. Kind of something that got the lesson going as far as something I saw, it was this quote, boys are in the news is having a hard time at the moment. They seem to be struggling, finding it harder and harder to succeed and conform and find a comfortable role in life. Statistics tell us that boys experience more behavioral problems can involve them more crime and at a younger age and are losing the acad uh, academic edge. Social, economic, and even educational changes seem to be undermining their essential manhood and some see the future as promising little but constant pressure or failure or both. And then this quote. Their self-esteem and motivation appear to be at rock bottom. However, many boys continue to do exceptionally well, and they are half our future. I think that's a good thing to remember. Boys are half the future, and girls are half the future. Given the changes taking place in society, particularly in employment and the family, growing boys will naturally feel confused and uncertain about their future and where they actually fit, and questions like, what does it mean to be a father? What is a good father? How important are commitment and marriage? How should they manage their sometimes contradictory, contradictory feelings of sadness and anger, tenderness, competitiveness, and protectiveness? And I do want to say that I don't necessarily think, though, that any things are any easier for girls. I think sometimes boys might think that it's easier for girls to live the Christian life. Or boys might think that they face more temptations than girls do. But the girls would probably say no. It's not easy for us either. There's a lot of temptations out there for us as well. And particularly for many godly women or girls that want to be godly women, they're probably wondering as well, as, as godly boys are thinking like, godly masculine boys are thinking, is there any place in this world for me? Godly women probably are thinking the same What thing. Is there any place in the world for me too? Because it seemed that, seems that none of us fit very well anymore. Yeah, we'll pick up the Bible, though. We run into confident men, confident Christians. In the book of Acts chapter 4, verse 13, here's one passage, and there's a number of them. The passage says, as they observe the confidence of Peter and John. Here we have two male Christians who are confident, confident in what they believe. In Acts chapter 5, and verse 42, not very much farther, we have this verse. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And that would include a number of Christians are doing that. And have confidence in the proclamation of that message. In Acts chapter 13, and verse 46, one word for confidence in the Bible that you might often find in a lexicon would be the word boldness. Same idea, but you probably might find the word boldness more. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. And so you do run into, you do run into confident Christians in the scriptures. Timothy was told, among other things, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 over 7, it looks like that Timothy, like a lot of us, struggled with our confidence, uh, struggle with our boldness and as we approach people with the gospel. Paul told Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. I like that. I like the combination there. It's not overconfidence. It is power. There is confidence. There is boldness there. And yet there's also love. 
And there's also this wonderful quality of discipline or self-control and discipline in what we say. It's almost like 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Be ready to give an answer, but give it with meekness and gentleness. Is you have boldness, but you also have self-discipline where it doesn't become overconfidence, and you've got the right motivation. A love for God and a love for other people. Paul would say in the same letter, but this time in verse 12 of chapter 1, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him against that day. I've always liked that passage. Many have pointed out that Paul did not necessarily say, I know what I have believed, even though that would be true. Paul did know what was the truth and what sort of things he needed to believe, but almost there's something more essential before you know what to believe. He says, I know who I believe. I know who I put my trust in. Now, I know what Jesus has said, but even more important than the what is the whom. I know who said it, and I know the person that said it I can trust. There are confidence boosters that we can give our kids as parents. There are many things that we can praise them for. Uh, on this chart, we can praise them for their thinking skills, their choices, uh, their ideas, their ability to solve problems, their social skills, things like being helpful and resolving conflict and their ability to share and their physical efforts like being a diligent worker. One other said, it's always good to be specific when you praise your children. Uh, to, to, center, to focus on something that they're doing right now that's good. Uh, sometimes it's really meaningful to say something specific to them. Instead of just a generic, a generic, you're doing a good job. Well, where am I doing a good job? What did I say that was right? But I want to move beyond that. I want to move beyond that because I want to move to a different or a deeper level of confidence here with our, our kids and our daughters and our sons. Because we can praise them for their abilities and skills, but their abilities and skills are going to fail them from time to time. And that's why I think we need to go a, a, a level deeper here. Eventually, you're going to run up against someone who's better at something than you are. It's always good to tell kids in athletics that. Uh, even when they get into the all-star games and state championships, uh, don't be shocked. Don't be shocked if you run into someone who may be better than you are. Uh, that's going to that's be a humbling experience, but that's going to be a good life lesson. At some time or another, our skills, even our good skills, are going not to be able to do the job. We're going to run up against where we've met our limitations. The, the good news, though, is that God has given us something far more solid to place our confidence in than just what we're good at and just where we're talented. And in the book of Proverbs, chapter 21 and verse 29, I want to look at that passage because we certainly don't want to be like this individual where it says, a wicked man shows a bold face. That is, he, he comes out very confident, kind of, uh, confidently, and he kind of goes, ha, like that, and we, whoa, what, what, what? And, and he, he shows a bold face, but it's a bluff. And the type of confidence that we're talking about is not the ability to bluff other individuals. It is actually a genuine confidence, a genuine boldness. And, for example, here's some passages I would have you look at. As a young man or a young lady, the, the foundation of my confidence is my relationship with God. If I know I'm right with God and I know I'm doing the right thing right now, that really is the major source of why I have any confidence about what I'm doing or how I'm living or about the future. Psalm 138 and verse 3, On the day thou didst answer me, thou didst make me bold with strength. And then he says, in my soul. 
Another passage to take a look at would be Acts chapter 4, verse 29, when the apostles prayed this prayer. Lord, take note of their threats and grant that thy bondservants may speak thy word with confidence. The confidence was in the message. God, we, we, want, we, we want help here. We want to be able to preach your word. We've been, we know it's the truth, but we want to be able to give your word a good, fair, accurate presentation. Another passage, Acts 9, 28. He was with them moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly, but then it says he was speaking boldly in the name of Lord Jesus. Again, the confidence was in the message of what he was presenting. Another passage, they spent a long time there speak, speaking boldly, and then it says, with reliance upon the Lord. And I think that's where the confidence sprang from, is it sprang from that relationship they had with God. We know we have the truth. We know this message is the right message. We may not be the best speakers of it. As far as eloquence. But we know this is the truth. That has to give you an edge. When you go into a conversation, you know you're right with God. You know that God is on your side. He entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning, persuading them about. Here is the subject matter about the kingdom of God. Pray on, beha on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. I think, I think that's where our confidence lies. I think that's a far more solid foundation, even than our skills, even the things that we're good at, is that next level, that, ne that next level is really where the bedrock is. That's never going to give way. I know I'm right with God. I know I'm on the right track. I know I have the truth. I know I'm saved. Let's move a little further here. One or said it can be liberating for any boy or man to hear that his confidence does not inherently reside in his skill or abilities. Rather that such godly boldness resides in his relationship with God and the fact that he has access to God's truth. And God's truth is always sure and God's truth is always right. I can second guess my abilities and we will. And there's nothing necessarily wrong about second guessing your abilities. Sometimes second guessing your abilities will keep you alive. You may be up on, on the slope. You may be up snowboarding. You may be looking down at a black diamond, and you may second-guess your abilities. That may be one of the smartest things to do at that moment, okay? You may be out motocross riding or whatever, and you may see a hill out in the woods or whatever, and it's slick and muddy, and it's straight up or whatever, and you may think, I'm good, but I don't know if I'm that good. That, that's a healthy thing at that point, to second-guess your abilities. But... We don't ever have to second guess God's wisdom. I think that's liberating to men that might feel like, do I have to do everything perfect all the time? Do I have to be able to do everything right? It's, it's okay as a man for certain things to walk away from, to say, I need somebody else to do that. Uh, your transmission may go out, and you may say, well, I've changed oil in my car. Maybe I've done brakes or whatever. And you start looking at that, and you might go like, that's beyond me. That's beyond me. That's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to know how to do everything. I know recently the, the dishwasher wasn't draining the water out of it. It was just staying in there. So I got the screwdriver and started going like, well... I mean, maybe I need a new one, but I might as well start digging down and see what's down in there. So one layer comes off after another layer. Get down, and there's, I don't know where these bolts came from, but there's a bunch of bolts in there and, and whatever. And, and, and lo and behold, I was able to fix it. I was like, able to fix the thing, put it back together. Sometimes there are things like that. Other, other times, other times, I already know. I already know. Uh-uh. No, no, not going there. Too much is on the line right now to dig into that particular thing. 
And then he says, so I, or I never have to second guess God's wisdom or the fact that he loves me, knows that I can understand his will. God knows I can live a godly life. As long as one knows that they are on his side, they can boldly say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. Or if God is for us, who's against us, Romans 8.31. I think that's liberating, though, for men. I don't have to know how to do everything perfectly. It's okay to second-guess myself now and then. I don't have to second-guess God, though. I don't have to second-guess God's wisdom. We want to avoid the following things when it comes to both men and women. Isolation, insecurity, insignificant. These three are deadly, especially when they, they, when, they, when they all gel together. You might say, Mark, what do you mean by that? Well, here's what I mean by that. If you've been thinking this, if you've been thinking this, this is dangerous. Number one, I don't need anyone. I don't really like people. Nobody understands me. Nobody understands what I'm going through right now. No one understands the challenge that I'm going through. And nobody cares about that. Nobody cares about what happens to me. Nobody cares if I sink or swim. And I can't do anything right. And I'm nobody. And I'll never find someone to love me. Those are all dangerous. They're really, really dangerous when they blend. Kind of like in the War of the Worlds. The ships, kind of when the ships came together in the original War of the Worlds, they created a shield that made them strong. Well, these three things, those three things, isolation, in, insecurity, and I forgot what the other one was right now, but whatever it was, they're deadly. They're deadly. Here's what we're aiming at. Here's what we want to accomplish. I want to spend a little time on that one. I want to look at resilience. Book of Proverbs, chapter 24, and in verse 15 and 16. Verse 16, I've probably read a lot of times, a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. But I don't know if I ever saw the word for. Because the word for in verse 16 indicates that it's connected to the previous verse. That it's not a verse in isolation. So 15 says, Do not lie in wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not destroy his resting place. Why? For a righteous man falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in time of calamity. And so, instead of being a verse that's a comfort to righteous people primarily, which it is, it almost seems that the original tent of Proverbs 24, 15 and 16 was a warning to the wicked. Do not go up against the righteous. Do not try to undermine them. Because the righteous survive and the wicked don't. And there's almost a warning there. Righteous people are resilient. Righteous people come back. Righteous people are the original, the original terminator of I'll be back. That's the righteous. The righteous people always come back. Uh, it's a bad comparison, but they're like dandelions. You can't get rid of them. No matter how much Roundup gets sprayed, gets sprayed on them, they're coming back. Here come the righteous again. We thought we got rid of them. No, they come back every year. You can never get rid of them. They'll always be back. That, that's the resiliency of the righteous. I, I know, and, and I think Leo, Leo made a, a good comment, and, uh, and, and that is uh, that uh, the real problem in our world is not economics, it's sin. Unfortunately, sometimes those two things go together. One affects the other. Uh, and, and sometimes we might feel like it is, if it's rough for God's people, but I don't know about you, I'm just amazed that there's any God's people left on this earth. I mean, after, after being, at least since the cross of Christ, after being sprayed with Roundup every single year for 2,000 years, I'm amazed that there's any of us left. And sometimes I guess we need to be amazed more about how many of us there are. The righteous are incredibly resilient. I want to go to the book of Esther and, and 
look at this passage. Haman had everything going for him. He was, he was in with the king. He was the king's best friend. The king basically had given him like a blank check that whatever he wanted to do, it looks like he had got to the point in his life that he thought he was the one running the kingdom. That whatever he wanted to do, he could get the king to go along with him and the king would sign on. That, that he was just in with the king. And so he has power behind him, he has influence behind him, he has, he has wealth behind him. In Esther chapter 6, though, it starts to crumble. And it's interesting what his family, his family and friends tell him in Esther 6, 13. Haman recounted to Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, everything that had happened to him that particular day, when the tables were reversed and he had to honor Mordecai. Then his wise men and Zeres, his wife, said to him, If Mordecai before whom you, whom you have begun to fall is of Jewish origin, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. And I think that's a lot like Proverbs, 20, Proverbs 24. The righteous are resilience. Do not. It's almost like, and you're kind of wondering, well, you should have... You, it'd be nice to know that, like before I built those gallows. Where were you guys? Where were you wise men before I hatched this plot? Where were you wise men when I talked about, and then you kind of gave me the idea to, well, do this or do that? But there's a warning don't go against the righteous, they're resilient, and you'll lose. We want to accomplish regeneration with our kids, where they become new people. We want to accomplish significance, that they realize that they're a man or woman created in God's image. And they are placed here to have dominion on the earth. We want to establish security with them, that they feel very secure in their relationship with God. And we want to encourage them and convince them that with God's will, they can be extremely capable. Now, Psalm 119. Of course, we, want, we don't want them being overconfident and, and arrogant. But in Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love thy law, it's my meditation all the day. Thy commandments make me wiser than I my, my enemies. I don't think that's overconfidence. I think that's just a reality that David has understood, that God's word gives him the edge. I have more insight than my teachers. I don't think that's arrogance there. I just think David realizes that on a certain level, in certain areas, that God's word is able to not only bring him up to speed with his teachers, but give him an edge on maybe certain teachers, maybe not all of them. And then he says, I understand more than the aged. I don't think he's saying... He understands more than aged, godly, righteous people, but maybe as a class, maybe as a class that he understands that God's word has enabled me to be wiser than my years. You don't have, you don't have to make a whole lot of mistakes early on in your marriage. According to that verse, or early on in your parenting. Now, that, that doesn't mean that you're ever going to be a perfect mate or a perfect parent. But I think Psalm 119 is saying, God's word gives you the ability to avoid certain pitfalls that other people fall into. You may, th you may think, is it really fair? Is it really fair to have kids when you're 20? when you don't know anything. Is, is that really fair? <laughs> and I think this verse says, you're not at a disadvantage. There's a reason God did it that way, but with the scriptures, with the scriptures, you can gain a wisdom, you can gain a wisdom presently that may have taken you many years otherwise to gain the same sort of practical wisdom. So, you're capable, you are prepared with scriptures. What they do need, I want to talk about a few things that kids do need, both sons and daughters. They need our love. You might be tempted to say that I did not have a father who expressed his love to me 
Therefore, my son or daughter will survive without my expression of love. One other said, though, and he warned us, those who don't get can turn this into don't need. Maybe run into a man or a woman who says, I don't need, I don't need any of that emotional stuff. I don't need any of that love stuff. What that is, is that's a smokescreen. It's a smokescreen to hide their sadness. They do need it. But they're trying to protect themselves. I'm trying to protect myself from being hurt, so I'm going to act like I don't need it. And things go really wrong. Things go really wrong when we act like we don't need things that we really do need. Got a comment here. If God so loved the world, and if I'm part of that world, then I think God says, Mark, you need love just as much as anybody else needs love. I remind us of 2, Titus chapter 2, verse 5, when older women are to encourage the woman to do certain things or train them or teach them. And one of the things is to love their husbands. Every man. And then it says to love their children. Every man needs love. And every child needs love. You'll never run into anybody who doesn't need love. They need me. Presents are no substitute substitute for presents. When spending time with your child, encourage reflection on the events of the day or the week. Help him see the big picture, how his future will be the sum total of all his little steps. His future will be the sum total of all his little choices, his his words, his little words, his little decisions. That's what his future will be. One other said, talk and touch, give them hugs and pats on the back, other forms of affection when speaking with them. Keep communicating with them even if you have to hold up the entire communication, the entire conversation. Keep communicating with them. Keep talking. I like to explain your decisions. Keep them informed on family plans. No one likes to be, no one's like to, no one likes to be given a last minute change of schedule. Let them know upcoming family plans, changes in routine. Give them advance notice about things. Explain your decisions that affect him, the reasons for those decisions. Sit down with him or her with scriptures and kind of walk through the passage and say, and here's how I came to that decision. Here's my thought process. Let them see how you think, how you arrive at a decision. Here's the passages that I considered. Here's the alternatives I considered. And here's why I made this choice. And be humble. Be humble. At times you might say, this is a judgment call. Would you pray for me that I've made the correct judgment call? Sometimes it's good to tell your kids... Kids, I've never had teenagers before, okay? You just have to understand that. I've never had teenagers before. This is new for me, all right? So I'm going to be patient with you, and you're going to have to have some understanding and patience with me because I've never done this before. So a little bit of humility always helps. Pray for me that we both come out all right. (laughs) <laughs> that you come out all right, and then I come out all right. Be a place of refuge. Uh, you're a safe person to talk to. Uh, they can find forgiveness with you. Your secrets will be safe with you, their secrets. And you understand their worries, and you take his concerns seriously. I think it's always good as a parent to let your kids know that you've gone through probably the exact same thing or many of the very similar things that they've gone through. I think that's helpful for boys too, and boys and girls, especially like boys or boys and girls that when they go through a breakup and their heart is broken, their heart is broken. I I think if you can come as a parent and say, I went through the exact same thing and this was the year, And here, let me go to the computer. Let me pull up some old songs on YouTube. And I want to show you, I know exactly how you feel. I know exactly what you're going through. I'm going to pull up a couple of old tear jerkers, okay? All right? There was some song I heard on the radio recently. uh, 
I think Dr. Hook in the medicine show sang it, Sylvia's Mother. I don't know if you remember that song. That is a sad song, Sylvia's Mother. But there's a couple other there's songs like that. Nazareth, Love Hurts. That's one I could pull up for my period of time. All right? And I think anyone said this is this is any anyone who listened to that would say, Dad, wow, you went through the exact same thing I went through, didn't you? Yes. And I can identify with your feelings. That might that that may not solve the problem. That may not make the pain go away. But at least I think kids feel a little bit better. That is that someone does understand. Someone does understand the pain that they're going through. All right. In tender, encourage tender qualities. Be a model of kindness and gentleness. Help him see how one should treat a woman with honor. First Peter three seven. Be an example of forgiveness and mercy. If you want your kids to be compassionate, then show mercy to them. Show mercy to them. As we close, tell him his story. Or her. Get out the family photos from time to time. Talk about the people and events shown in them. Let him see the vital role that he presently fills in the family. And the even bigger role that he or she will be playing in the future. Most importantly, tell them, tell them where they fit in God's story of redemption. Where do they fit there? Where do they fit in the Bible story? And where his or her talents are needed in God's church or God's kingdom? Last chart. Help him see how his life is intertwined with the lives of many others. Who's counting on him? Little things like, you know what? Your grandma or grandpa would really like a, probably like a call from you right now. Help him see how other people's lives are entwined with his or her life. Who needs him right now? You know, your younger brother and sister right now might need, you to, might need some encouragement from you. Remember, they're watching you. Who will need him in the future? You know, mom and dad are going to get older. We might have to live with you one day. <laughs> or, I might have to have you do things for me one day. Right now, I can mow the lawn. I can cut wood and get on the roof and take off the moss and clean the gutters. But I may need your help one day to do that. And the world needs you. The world needs more young men like you. The world needs more young ladies like you. Maybe there's one here this morning who's not a Christian. The Bible says to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Turn from your sins, repent. Confess your faith in Christ. Be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. The world also needs more saved people. The world needs more salt in it. Would you like to save the world? Would you like to help save others too? Would you, do you want to live for God? Whatever your need is, come as we stand and sing together.